So good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to introduce Carl Mehta. Carl, why don't you sit down for a minute? Okay. Uh, I first knew about Carl when a common friend sent me a letter. Uh, Sandeep Pandya, many of you might have heard of him. Uh, he used to be the president of IIT Bombay Heritage Fund, which is the Alumni Association. And of course, a close personal friend. In fact, his father, the close personal friend who was a faculty member, a professor here, and Sandeep was a campus kid. But that introduction was very sketchy. Much later, I knew far more about what he has done. So let me tell you in a very brief nutshell. He is a hardcore techie from Mumbai. It is very sad that he was not part of IIT system. Otherwise, I could have touched him for large donations, <laughs> which I will still continue, continue. to try anyway. Sure. But more importantly, he went to the US. Uh, I was amazed to find out that he actually, his expertise is in payment systems. In fact, he is writing a book which will shortly be released. Because I have dabbled on the bank's payment systems for years as an advisor and consultant. So I know how hard those problems are. He set up a company of his own, which did some remarkable stuff in technology. And then, when he had brought it up to a certain level, he sold it to Visa at an undisclosed large sum. His ambition was that by the time he is 40 years old, he should have made all the money that he needs in life so that he can spend the rest of his life in doing those constructive things which he enjoys doing. A very interesting penchant. I, I really love him for that. Unfortunately, when you sell a company to a large organization like Visa, you are bound to work for them for a few years. So he worked with them for two years. And subsequently, he became a venture capitalist. He was on the team which advised Obama, President Obama. So a set of people who advised Obama. In fact, he is here today as part of the official uh, Kerry delegation which went for vibrant Gujarat. And he will be part of Obama delegation when President Obama comes for the 26th January parade. So, <coughs> when he was working as a venture capitalist, he describes his life in a very interesting way. He says, every day I get two or three proposals and term sheets. Two of them I find flaws immediately, I throw them away. Third one I say we can fund it. And then the funding starts and the activity goes on. But day after day, month after month doing that, I felt that I was not doing myself anything. You can appreciate, most of you are techies, so if you are not dirtying your hands, okay, somewhere doing something yourself, you feel uncomfortable. So one fine day, he quit that job and he says, I will go back again to the startup mode, but this time, startups which are close to the passion of my heart. And his passion, like me and like many of us here, has been education, good quality education. So that is when he set up a company called Aircast. There were a group of young people here in IIT Bombay led by Nikhil. Nikhil is here? Yeah. Uh, a small company in our startup. And uh, he says that, will you be willing to work for Aircast? So he acquired that company. And that company now is the Aircast India arm. Curiously, they work within a few miles of IIT Bombay in Hiranandani. So they have an office here. <coughs> when I found out more about Edcast, I found that they had done some amazing modifications and additions to the OpenEDX platform. Their work is also based on OpenEDX. Then there is another organization called ICRISAT, which offers agricultural courses to agricultural learners from across the world. But they are situated in India, so they wanted to start some courses in India. And they had made a presentation to the national mission for a project proposal where they said that we will be based, basing our thing on Edcast. And the standing committee advised them, no, 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 Fatak is working on OpenEDX, so start using that platform. It turned out that we are talking about the same thing without knowing it. That is when I got more interested. I met him in uh, the Boston uh, OpenEDX conference where uh, Aparna and Shweta were with me. And I was quite excited to hear what he was doing. 
So recently when I had gone to Washington, I made a special two-day trip to Bay Area and spent one and a half hours with him and his colleagues on what they are doing on uh, aircast. And I was so thrilled, I tell you, uh, that I said I would invite you here to give a talk to whatever you are doing, uh, primarily because you should know that why with, in our own capacity we are doing variety of things, but what they are doing is amazing. They have very large vision centered around the youth of tomorrow. So for example, the social media, the way youth uses social media, we have actually not paid attention in our work on the open EDX on the social media. It's an exciting thing. And more importantly, uh, he has agreed that we shall have a long-term partnership because of the similarity of thoughts, similarity of the technology that we're doing, and similarity of purpose. So I'm grateful to Carl for sparing his time and coming here and sharing his thoughts. Uh, thanks also to Nikhil. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm very bad at names. I forgot the yeah, yeah. Vijay and Prashant. Prashant. So Vijay and Prashant are part of the Aircast team. Uh, as I said, uh, some of you will be seeing more of them in coming months and years. So that is why it is important for you to note uh, uh, Prashant, uh, Nikhil, and Vijay. Vijay, right. So thank you very much for sparing your time. And without further ado, I will request Carl to share his vision, his work at Edcast, and how he sees things moving forward uh, to all of us. And welcome, Carl. Oh, thank you very much, sir. So very grateful uh, to Professor Fatak. Uh, he's a towering personality, Bharat Ratna, to be introduced by him is, is very humbling. And I have a small gift for you. Oh, so. Goodness. The book that I mentioned that oh, I'm writing, well, this is the first manuscript and it's going into printing, but I wanted to give you the actual manuscript. So, thank you. Thank you. Because I, I we need your, uh, yeah, yes, no, no, I'm going to, uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, I'm going to, we will we'll meet, it, yes. But uh, this is needed for your blessings before it goes into printing. Oh, oh, Not, you, nice. don't, you don't get the commercial copy. <laughs> 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 so, um, you know, uh, I think uh, the, the introduction that Professor Fatak gave was, uh, I think, very glorified. But uh, I think uh, I'll, I'll still give you a little bit of background on myself just in my own way so that you get just some context on uh, my background. So um, I did my undergrad in, uh, at University of Bombay. So sorry, I, I didn't uh, pass the, I, I mean, well, actually I did pass the IIT JE, but they were giving me into civil engineering and I wanted to do, uh, elect at that time computer science was not there 22 years back, so it was electrical engineering. and. Uh, didn't realize that it's okay to go into IIT with civil engineering and then you can go to the states and always change your major, you know. So that hack was not, I, I didn't know that hack. So a lot of my other friends did that. Uh, but I'm kind of half IIT alumni, so I spent one year as a junior research fellow at the EE department because I wanted to be in EE. So I spent a year with uh, Professor Jay Vasi and uh, Chandorkar and they were all there 20 years back and uh, I worked at the VLSI Design Center, uh, one of the first uh, US project that was outsourced to IIT Bombay to the VLSI Design Center on digital signal processing by Texas Instruments. I was part of that. So it was, where it was fun working here. I was bicycling in this campus almost like uh, 22 years back, so it's great to be back here. Uh, so quickly, why I got into education. So I built about three companies in Valley, uh, in Silicon Valley. Uh, one in multimedia, one in mobile, and then the third one was in payment, which um, uh, we sold to Visa. And uh, I have been very passionate about education, mainly because I've been looking at the same problem that Professor Fatak and all of you uh, see here. We, we are 1.2 billion people country. Uh, we are all very fortunate that we got into good education. We are in the premier institute here, IIT Bombay. Um, but we, we see around, we drive around, you go around the country and you see that most people don't have even basic education. And uh, so I joined the board uh, several years back. I joined the board of Pratham. I don't know how many of you know Pratham, but Pratham is, uh, if you don't know, please check it out, Pratham.org. Pratham is the largest education nonprofit in the world, started in Mumbai by, uh, you know, Dr. Madhav Chavan, uh, who, is a prof who was a professor at uh, the, uh, what's the, the Chemical Engineering Institute uh, at, in Matunga, what's the, uh, called UDCity. Uh, he went to U.S., he did his Ph.D., he was a professor in the U.S., he came back. He gave up his whole academic thing and he started this 
this incredible organization called Pratham, which now provides primary education to four million kids a year. So there is no uh, there is no institution. There is no institution in the world. There is no nonprofit in the world that educates four million kids in the world. Right? And we have schools, um, and, and and that those four million kids gets educated by seventy thousand teachers. And this seventy thousand teachers, they are all volunteers. Right? So imagine all of us. We all get paid for our job, and sometimes how difficult it is to get come to work in the morning. And you know, we think of some reason not to go to work. These are 70,000 teachers here in India. They go to work every day without getting paid. Right? And but most of the Pratham schools that you find, they're called Balwadis. I'm sure you know there's hundreds of them in Mumbai. They're in, in Dharavi, in slums, in villages. Some of our Balwadis don't even have a four wall. You know, the classroom is under a tree. Even today, in 2014, right? we're not talking about like 1914, but 2014, where there is a class, um, you know, they, they just hang a blackboard. So anyway, uh, sorry. So my, my, my journey into education began with the eye opening of Pratham and looking at the large scale that education is not only a quality problem, uh, but education is a scale problem. Because you know, how do you scale and give education to 4 million kids every year? So one of the first thing that we did as a, as a, as a board member uh, and as, as a tech person for, for Dr. Madhav Chavan, and by the way, Dr. Madhav Chavan has received an award, um, is, is very illustrious as Dr. Fatak. Uh, he's received an award, uh, which is the Nobel Prize equivalent in education. You know, I, I can't remember the name, but it's, uh, there's, there's an award that is given to an uh, educator. So we built an Android app um, just for the 70,000 teachers because you know, some of the issues are so basic, like even when they want to order like chalks or some supplies, you know, they write a letter to the, the, the whole central command is in Bombay. They have like about 200 people in Bombay and all over the country uh, across India, you know, they send the supplies to them. And we said, well, you know, you, can, you know, the kids can't be waiting for two days because there's no class because they don't have a chalk. I mean, you know, that's pathetic, right? So, so we built a basic app. We said, well, you know, at least the 70,000 teachers can afford a, a basic uh, Android smartphone or we will give them. And then why don't we put some apps so that, you know, they can request things. They can take a picture. Madhav said that, you know, I want to know attendance every single day at 4 million kids. So we said, well, you know, you can't count and all of that stuff. Maybe if we take just a picture of something and then, you know, there is some kind of an OCR or whatever. But anyway, so that was my journey into eye-opening, into how big the education problem is and, you know, how much technology has not made its way into education. And in the U.S., they say, by the way, as much as U.S. is uh, very advanced, in fact, uh, people openly admit that education and healthcare are the two sectors that are the, the, the worst users of technology. I mean, they are the last adopters of technology, even in the U.S., by the way. So it's, uh, it's not a criticism to uh, IIT or, or India, but, you know, in general. So, so that was the thing that brought me into education. And when I saw first, um, uh, you know, edX, so I met... Uh, uh, and then, so the, the way I got into edX was that I was looking at now solutions saying, okay, well, I'm looking at Pratham's problem to solve for primary kids at, at scale. What are the solutions that people are addressing at the college level? And I saw companies after companies in Silicon Valley as a venture capitalist, you know, uh, Coursera and Udacity and Udami's of the world, and they would come and pitch us for money and things like that. And I was, wasn't convinced that if this is all the right approach. Uh, in between, I was, as uh, Professor Fadak said, I spent a year at the White House. I was a presidential, first presidential innovation fellow. So I worked with the Department of Education and saw some of the first end issues of U.S. has some major crisis in higher ed. I don't know if, 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 you, if you've been keeping a tab of that, but we have a trillion dollars in, um, trillion dollars bubble in uh, higher ed loans, right, student loans. So if, if that bursts, it, it can have a massive crisis. So higher ed is almost uh, unaffordable by an average American. So imagine a first world country, a developed country, where an average American cannot afford to send their kids for a four-year <laughs> degree program. In fact, actually, India sounds much better. We have much more affordability, thanks to government and policies and all of that, that actually India in, the, in, some, in, in a lot of ways is in a much better position than United States. So U.S. is going down in a, in a, in a you know, really bad um, you know, uh, situation if we don't fix that problem. 
And then the second, uh, another third dimension to education was, uh, I, was uh, I was appointed by Governor Brown of California uh, on the Workforce Investment Board. So the California government invests about a billion dollars into over three levels of uh, education system. We have you know, the UCs, which are the top tier, the UC Berkeley's and all of that. So we have UC system, then we have the Cal State system, so that we have 22 campuses like Cal State Northridge and Cal State Long Beach and all of those. And then we have 108 community colleges. Right, so those are commuter colleges, what we call in America. So those are 108. Right? And we invest about roughly uh, a, more than a billion dollars every year. And so I'm on that committee to approve you know, which colleges get the money. And I realized that, you know, and we, we get to see all the proposals. And I, I could see as a technology person 20 years seeing the technology adoption in other sector that none of these colleges were thinking about even using some of this you know, large scale open education technology because when we see this trillion dollar bubble crisis, I'm looking at, you know, why can't you use technology to lower down the cost? Because the cost in America, as you all know, is just, you know, so high because the people cost so high, right? And so technology has to balance the people cost and they were not thinking about it. And then luckily in that quest to find the right technology to solve this problem, I ran into Professor Anand Agarwal at the World Economic Forum in Davos. And it was just, this, is an, this whole EdCast thing is, is an accident uh, because I ran into him at a, um, at a Harvard party so, uh, in Davos. And I was not even knowing him. We were just like at a party, you go and talk to like strangers and you just say hi to him because you see another fellow Indian in Davos, like, you know. So, and he introduces me, and he introduces himself and says, you know, hey, I'm a professor at MIT and I've just started, this was two, years back about roughly. So he said, I've just started, the, you know, this, I mean, ZX was known at that time. And, um, and I really immediately fell in love with uh, the concept because I had seen all the commercial ones, the Coursera, Udacity, Udami by that time. And I was waiting for something like this to come in an open source, in a nonprofit way to really do good to the society, you know, because this problem really needs to more than business model, it needs first to do good to the society. And second thing, to have a sustainable business model. So, so Anant and I spent almost like late night, almost up to two in the morning, maybe either both of us were drunk or whatever it was, but we spent almost uh, you know, late in the morning uh, discussing about how to scale edX. And uh, I said, well, and at that time he promised me, just like he promised Professor Fardak, I heard from Professor Fardak's keynote at Harvard, uh, that he promised me that he was going to make it open source. It wasn't an open source at that time. You know, so in January of 2013, it was not. Uh, and then in June last year, June last year, he made it open source. So he followed through on his commitment. And uh, so I said, um, so Anand, uh, so I told Anand that, look, you know, I want to do something in education because I'm, I've seen this problem through the White House. I'm seeing it through the California Workforce Investment Committee. Uh, I've experienced it through Pratham. I'm into all this and I'm kind of a retired fellow. Uh, I'm looking for next thing to do, you know. And he says, uh, so he actually gave me the business idea. So he says, look, you know, I'm going to open source this, but you know, we have a lot of uh, institutions, corporates, nonprofits, they come to us to edX and says, can you host a edX version for us? And he said that, that's not edX's business. He says, that's not my vision. Uh, I mean, Anand said that that's not my vision. He says, we have to be more like focus on being parallel to Coursera and always getting better at Coursera, which is keep a central site that has, and he says his focus is all content. He says, end of the day, the highest quality content and highest quality course, that is gonna make edX successful. Because when people go to edX.org, their brand name is all based on high quality courses. When people see, eminent professors like Professor Fatak's course, then people are gonna say, well, edX is good, right? So he says, he doesn't look at edX as a technology business. He looks at, so that's why he says, I'm, I'm going to open source technology because he realized that it's not the technology race. It is all about the highest quality content and the largest amount of distribution to reach. So, and, and, and I was quite impressed with him because, you know, um, being, coming from the business side of the world for 20 years, I generally have a healthy skepticism about some professor's ability to think through about business models. And, and uh, I was quite impressed that, you know, what he's saying makes sense. At least, you know, he's figured out that what are the two things that really matter in his business and what are the things that don't matter, you know, because most people are not even crisp and clear about those things. They're like, 
confusing and kind of, you know, and trying to, uh, you know, go into like multiple things. So he was very sharp, very clear that, you know, it's content and it's reach. And he says, this whole technology thing, we're willing to give it up, make it open source, and folks like you from Silicon Valley who are the technology people, you guys should be engaged, and you and Google and Stanford's of the world, you know, go ahead and build stuff on it. And he would be the beneficiary of it and says, that's how we're going to scale on technology, not by hiring the largest number of engineers into the edX offices in Cambridge. He's going to run out of funds very soon if he keeps hiring people for technology. So that was a smart idea to say, hey, you know what? I want to leverage the volunteering and the open source crowd. The second thing he said that, look, even distribution, which is his number two goal, access, he cannot reach just by having that one single site and trying to bring every single eyeballs in the world to edX.org. So he realized that people would need institutions around the world, corporates around the world, they would need their own version, you know, localization, whole bunch of needs are there. And that cannot be addressed by, again, a single site, a destination site like edX.org. So that's where he gave me the business idea. And he said, you know, you have all this background because, you know, we had built uh, a very highly scalable in my previous company that we sold to Visa. We had built a very large scale payment processing platform in the cloud that became like the multi, you know, uh, multi-channel uh, payment processing for Visa today. And, you know, the level of scale that is needed on the cloud, the level of security that is needed for, you know, transactions, uh, you know, so he, as a, prof you know, as, as a very smart guy and, and technology person, he could see the value. He could immediately say that, look, you've done all this stuff. So why don't you take the edX code and provide a SaaS service, software as a service, put it massive scale on the cloud. And he said that, look, I will bring you businesses which means that all these people who are knocking the doors of edX saying that I want my own version, so I'm going to refer it to you. And again, even on that second front, he absolutely followed up on that. Immediately, you know, when we both went back, uh, you know, from Switzerland back to, to, to the US, you know, he connects me to his business development guy. We have an agreement signed up. We were the first company to sign an agreement where, and since from, from that day to, to now, most of our customers are actually today that we are service, servicing, they are, they are all edX referrals. So every institution, Fortune 500 company that goes to edX and says, we want to run an edX you know, platform, they send it over to EdCast. So that is kind of the history, both the personal history of how I got into education and then kind of the, the history of how we started EdCast. Um, this is some of the slide deck that um, I had used. Uh, so Aparna and uh, the, the other person, sorry, what's your name? Shweta. You probably saw that at, at what I presented at Harvard, so sorry for the repetition. <laughs> um, but uh, essentially, and then, um, you know, we also, uh, back in California, I realized that uh, I'm just a technology person. I have no experience in education as a domain and the pedagogies and all of that. So I need an educator. Uh, person as a partner. So I partnered and brought uh, Dr. Paul Kim as a co-founder. Dr. Paul Kim, he is the chief technology officer at Stanford University of their grad school of education. So someone who has spent 25 years of his life into education technologies, learning technologies, learning sciences, that's all, all his research is about. And he's spent actual time in the field. He's been hired by the United Nations, by the governments all over the world. He's come to Bihar and has tested I have never been to Bihar, but he has been to Bihar and has tested mobile learning on tablets. He has gone to Saudi Arabia by the invitation from the king of the Saudi Arabia to test mobile learning. So amazing person. Uh, you can check his uh, profile on the, on the internet. Uh, so I partnered with him. So it, you know, we, in Silicon Valley, we believe in complementary team and knowing what you don't know, more import that's more important than what knowing what you know. Right, so, and, and finding, not trying to focus on your weakness because there are always other people who have strength in your area of weakness. So might as well partner with them. Uh, so the, the whole thing is, so essentially what EdCast stands for, so by the way, so we were incubated actually at Stanford because of Dr. Paul Kim and my affiliation with Stanford because of my venture fund. And then Stanford University liked this idea as well because you, you remember that Stanford's online education attempt, the class, uh, you know, EDU, they merged into edX. So Stanford University came and invested in our company, which was a pretty big endorsement, and it is a, it's, it's a great uh, you know, credibility uh, mark on us. And so the, the, our whole thing is, our mission is to expand 
the open edX ecosystem. So that's in a, in, a, in a summary, you know, what our mission is that we want to expand the ecosystem. Um, why open, right? Because the opposite of open isn't closed. So what is it? What's the opposite of open? <laughs> so something that is not open is broken, right? And so it's very important, especially in, in technology and in software that, you know, the more it is open, because then anything that is broken will get fixed, right? We cannot limit to just the people in the room or people in our organization to do things. We have to figure out a way to collaborate with anybody and everybody in the world who has an ability to contribute and we should, we should be reducing the friction. So, so we, love, we love open edX mainly because of that open source and, and many other interesting things. And uh, so I'm going to quickly run into what our capabilities are. Uh, so, you know, as, you, as I said that we started with the business plan and business idea that my friend Anand Agarwal gave to me. So uh, I can't claim actually the, 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 the business plan. So, so that's where we started, which is SaaS and cloud services. And this is very large scale multi-tenant systems and things like that. And we'll show you, um, you know, like dozens and dozens of institutions that are running on it. The second thing that we focused on, and that this was also something that we discussed originally with, with, uh, with Anand, was that I said, look, um, you know, this whole education platform and MOOCs and all of this is all fine, but you know, you can bring the greatest content and the rock star professors from elite universities and everything, but what if, it's like bringing water to the horse, but what if the horse doesn't drink, okay? How do you solve that problem? So, because when I talk to a lot of government officials, uh, in fact, yesterday I was at Vibrant Gujarat for the opening of our, uh, uh, one of my nonprofit Code for India's uh, chapter there, and I met the education minister um, of Gujarat, and he told, and I, we showed him the demo and everything of Open edX, and he, his first question was that. He says, you know, we have brought broadcast uh, courses and this, that, all kinds of stuff, we have content, but if the students are not learning, how do you solve that problem, right? So he says, this is not a technology problem. This is not even a content problem. This is not even a faculty problem. <laughs> so what problem is this? So, well, this is a motivation problem, right? And so in the, in the education world, and, and I, I, you know, I mean, people who are into that department of education or people who do their PhD in education, uh, I'm, they know this problem. So there is a lot of research goes on into just the fundamentally what motivates people to learn and what are the systems and techniques that can be used to motivate people. And that is a fundamental problem because for someone, if we can solve that problem, because someone who is motivated, even a B level content and a C level technology, all that stuff doesn't matter. See all the IITs that IIT has produced even 30 years back, you know, we didn't have, I mean, we had a great professor, but we didn't have technologies and things like that. So, so this thing, uh, we took the metaphor or learning from many other fields. So think about, so everybody wants to educate, uh, wants to be educated, everybody wants to be learned because they know that that will increase their income level, go up in the society, all of that, but they don't feel motivated. I mean, there are 5% of the people on this planet who don't need motivation. They are all here, uh, you know, or all of you are in that 5% category, right, all of us. But, you know, what we realize is that 95% of the people on this planet, they need motivation to learn. Right? We see with our kids also, you know. Um, but if you see the opposite, you know, in, instead of education, now you change that to entertainment, it's the opposite ratio. 95% of the people on this planet don't need motivation for entertainment. You tell anybody, movie, shall we go for movie, you know, watch this video on YouTube, do you think that that person needs motivation? 95% don't, maybe 5%, there are also nerds who would not watch that, right? So, but, but the ratio is exactly the opposite, right? So the fundamental thing is that, okay, how, if we, so the way to solve the, this motivation problem is that if we can turn education more like entertainment, then we can solve the problem. Okay, so now, of course, we are not asking Professor Fadak to dance and entertain you <laughs> or sing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can't do much. Maybe there are some courses that might blend, it, it lend itself into singing, but <laughs> not probably physics or I don't know, mathematics. So, 
but one thing we realize that within entertainment now right there is this new type of entertainment which is where we are all consuming time which is the social media entertainment we are all spending less time on tv less time on those televised you know entertainment and more time on social media entertainment right so there's all this more there's people spend more number of hours every day on facebook and whatsapp than they spend on tv or maybe they then they spend with their spouse or their family that's very unhealthy right that's where the country is going where actually yesterday the one of the education so so when i when i gave this offer to the education minister i said okay you know you are saying that your biggest problem in gujarat is that how to bring motivation first forget about all this and then i said okay this is the answer to that then he says well but you know my biggest problem is that i hate the social media because i think that the social media is taking way too much time of the kids and they are not learning so we said okay fine we try to solve one problem and create another problem <laughs> okay because i try to solve your motivation problem with social media now you say social media is a problem okay so so then the the solution is that okay how do we blend really the you know take the content which is serious content because a lot of time education is going to be serious content but can you wrap it around in a really nice way with your social media so that it feels like entertainment at least the environment feels like very comfortable very friendly your you know it feels like you're virtually hanging out with your friends it feels like you're chatting with them which everybody likes chatting but the whole context is education so that was uh, kind of the the idea that was talked to to anand and this he said brilliant you know do that and i said look silicon valley is the place for social media we have facebooks of the world and the googles of the world we know exactly how to do that stuff we will take care of that so that's where you know we 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 built stuff on that and you know um, if i can get a i didn't uh, plug in my wifi on my laptop but if i can get a wifi then uh, we will we'll show you some of the stuff and then the the third thing was obviously as i said that you know when um, this um, institutions and enterprises and they all need their own instances uh the other the big thing that comes is a lot all kinds of integration services so then we built a whole set of apis and how do we you know connect with other third party we created you know lti plugins and you know the many other ways to integrate through our own apis as well as lti so um yeah i'm going to fast forward a couple of things we talked about yeah so let me finish this one or two slides and then we so what have we what have we learned so far you know so we've been in this business now uh, for a little more than 18 months we started right before right after davos and right before even edx went open edx and uh, so we've been there for now for a little more than 18 months or 20 months and what we have learned is that you know ultimately um, well first of all everything that you do has to be learner centric so it's it's a nice uh, it sounds like a cliche but uh, you know everything that we see uh, all the old systems the previous generation systems that were built they were all built with you know either institution centric or faculty centric or course centric right so if you see all those course management systems the moodles and the blackboards of the world they were all or course centric or they were very institution centric but nothing was built by putting the user at the center of everything which is what if you think about if you look at non education software in the consumer internet space they are all built with putting the user at the center right if you look at facebook right putting the user at the center if you look at whatsapp why whatsapp has such a high adoption because you as a user can immediately connect and use and all of that stuff so that's the number one thing that we learned that you know we got to put the mantra has to be that we have to put for everything that we think and do you have to put the user at the center and the ultimately uh, you know the rubber meets the road not just on technology but we is all about pedagogies because if you don't have all the right pedagogies implemented using technology nothing's going to work right because just throwing a nice video you know whatever put a quiz it's not going to work you know and because you know it, it it has to be done in a way that people can really learn so there are some new pedagogies evolving emerging which is what we talked about like you know this whole social learning although you know i'm making it sound you know something very uh, kind of casual that you know just you know make it entertaining and all of that stuff but there is a pretty deep research around it there are some very deep research papers that are written around all these pedagogies right professor fata talked about blended learning and you know i i, I wholeheartedly agree with him he says that look 
online education can't work you know, on its own, it has to be blended learning, right? Uh, there, is, there is a really good re uh, research paper, uh, can't remember the author, but if I find it, I will send it, and you might have read it already, on active learning. And there is a really good data presented where active learning improves outcomes, you know, almost by 10x, uh, and this is not a rhetoric, but it's like a real, they have real data to prove than the traditional, you know, lecture-based education, right? So uh, a friend of mine um, uh, at UC Irvine who is, uh, who is a vice, uh, who is a uh, associate dean, uh, he says that uh, if lecture-based education were clinical trials, they would have been banned long, many years back. <laughs> so if you send the lecture-based education the same what the pharmaceutical industry does, they would be banned by, you know, the, the equivalent of FDA, right? So anyway, um, adaptive learning, team-based learning, you know, and then this is something that there isn't that much data or research around it, but we kind of, we could claim uh, to have invented, uh, which we call bite-sized learning or slash nano-learning or micro-learning. And this is a very cutting edge stuff, which is saying that, you know, how do we engage students in just uh, what I like to call from my gaming world analogy is snackable learning. So you all heard in, so when I first went into the gaming industry, you know, I realized that there are three types of games, right? The hardcore, I don't know how many of you play online games, but there's, there are hardcore games, then there are, so you know, like World of Warcraft type of them, they're like hardcore games. Then there are mid-core games, which is, you know, all the Sony PlayStation and, X, you know, Xbox type of games. And then there is called, like, the, there was a new category that emerged just a few years back, which is casual slash social games, right? I'm sure a lot of you have played games on Facebook, like the Zynga games and Farmville and all that stuff, right? So realize that, you know, when we're, I'm trying to think of the parallels of educa education and entertainment, what is, the, what is the equivalent of those three levels in education, you know? I, when I was studying in college, everything sounded hardcore. <laughs> <laughs> the professors were hardcore, the content was hardcore, the assignments were hardcore, you know, so that's why I lost my hair. So, <laughs> so, so I, was, I was thinking, why can't, edu <laughs> why can't education have some equivalent of some mid-core and like, you know, casual, okay, where I'm learning, but I'm not feeling stressed that, oh my God, I have to do this, I have to do this, I don't get it, I don't, you know. So, so that's where this, and, and you know, those casual games are invented, which is basically they're called like uh, snackable games. So now we are calling snackable education, which is you just snack on it. Like, you know, five times a day you can play the game, right? There's little games like, you know, on the phones that you play. You have like 10 minutes on the bus station, you're waiting for the bus and you play, what is the, the, the big game that everybody's playing now on the phone? Candy Crush. Candy Crush, right? Candy Crush, yeah. My wife keeps playing all the time. And it's like crazy, you know, they're like addicted to it, right? Every 10 minutes they get, they play Candy Crush and then they're done. So the, the beauty of the design, you know, if you think from an instructional design, the beauty of that game is such that whether you have five minutes, 15 minutes or 30 minutes, you can enjoy. And as soon as somebody wants your attention, you can close it and you're fine. So that sequencing, you know, that way of packaging the content, and that way of even like five times a day, so that's basically a new whole pedagogy of how to create content and make it bite-sized learning. And then this one is a very interesting new field, inquiry-based learning, which is, you know, uh, so my co-founder, Dr. Paul Kim, he says that, you know, the best way of teaching is not to teach. Okay. So this is a guy with 25 years of experience in researching on teaching and learning, and he says the best way of teaching is not to teach. Okay, so then how do you teach? <laughs> and he says, this is his thing, he's writing research paper on this, he says that do not teach anything unless the student in your classroom asks you a question. So what it means is inquiry based. Unless your students don't have an in, a feeling of inquiry, that I want to inquire into this, and they ask a question, you answer. Another guy, inquiry. If you don't have inquiry, don't come and just lecture. So anyway, very, very cool idea. Uh, it can be obviously done very nicely in a classroom. For folks like us in technology space, we have to think about how to replicate that in the online world, right? Because in the online world, also, we don't want to just bombard them with content, but we want to say that, okay, what are their questions, you know? 
So, so that is we have learned. Obviously, uh, we learned that you know there is lots of different use cases and lots of different user types. They are way beyond even what the open edX uh, would look at it. Uh, one of the interesting use case, uh, which we coined this term that the media in the US loves it, we, we coined this new term called multiversity. We trademark it. People do not like it that you trademark, but you know, <laughs> we love to trademark some new word term. But so, multiversity is a really new, nice use case where uh, one of our first customers was Professor Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University, who is a very eminent professor in the, uh, he's, a, he's a founder and director of Earth Institute at Columbia. And um, he is the global authority in uh, climate change and sustainable development. So he's the advisor to the UN. And actually, he brought us this use case, and then we term, turned it into a term. So he says that you know, he has built a sustainable development solutions network, which is a group inside United Nations. And he has brought in about 39 universities worldwide to become a member of that consortium. So UC Berkeley, Stockholm University, they are all members of it, Columbia, obviously. And these are all the universities that are teaching this master's degree program called MDP, Master's in Developmental Practice. So you get basically it's a master's in you know, uh, sustainable development and developmental practices. And he says that, look, uh, there is no point for my network of 39 universities, and he wants to expand that network, and it's already, by the way, 200 universities have signed up to become a member. He says, there is no point for 200 university, each lecturer instructor is the exact same curriculum, MDP. Masters in developmental practice and so has the exact same courses. And he says, I want, make, I want to make sure that everybody has access to the highest quality content. I, you know, I don't want too much variability. And um, I don't want my fellow professors to spend the time in research creating the same content that's already been created. So he put together a group in uh, Earth Institute because obviously, and some of universities have more budget, some universities don't have that much budget. He has a lot of budget because, you know, he gets. You know, he wants money, he just calls Bill Gates and Bill Gates writes him a check, you know, so because of his authority. So he put together a team at Columbia and he spent a million dollars per course, literally, million dollars, very high production value courses on age of sustainable development, climate change negotiation. And he said that, look, I want this course to be taken by all these 39 universities, but not in a MOOC style, in the blended learning concept, which means that. I will run it in one instance, which is a central instance where this 39 university students can go in. But there is a local flavor because the individual is not trying to take away the empowerment of the, the local instructor or local professor because they are also great authority. But they should be able to interact with the local classroom because these courses are being, uh, you know, the actual uh, on campus students. So we created this open edX in our cloud services. We created a way where one course, one instance of the course is a global course, which can be published as a MOOC. So anybody in the world can take it as well. And then there is an another instance which is only available to these 39 universities, but also these 39 universities, each one of them have their own identity. So for the first time ever in the world, these 39 university students who were all learning the same thing are now able to collaborate with each other and talk. So think about even in 2014, we were with all the technologies around us and even in Silicon Valley, two universities like Stanford and UC Berkeley, which are like less than 50 miles apart, there has never been any collaboration at the student to student level, even if you are learning the same thing. And I am talking about real collaboration at the education. Sure, they can chat on Skype or they might find each other on Facebook and they might talk about the same robotics course or AI artificial intelligence course, that is different. But there has never been or even today a course that the same UC Berkeley and Stanford student is taking and now they are collaborating, the faculty is collaborating and they are not all wasting time and reinventing and doing the same thing. Because the value is not in all of those stuff, the value is in actual rich interaction that you free up. So we pioneered this um, for the first time uh, with Professor Jeffrey Sachs and this 39 universities and it is going on actually it just finished right, the, the course just finished. And those 39 university students got credit. So, we were also kind of pioneering MOOCs for credit because that was another big uh, focus for us or mission for us because we want MOOCs to be recognized or open courses to be recognized to be awarded credit because otherwise this MOOC uh, you know, revolution is going to slow down because if students do not see any value, you know. So, anyway, so, so that is a very uh, interesting one. 
The other interesting use cases that are coming up is governments involving as you know Professor Fatak is championing here you know countries like Jordan and Saudi Arabia there is a country level MOOCs happening. So, you know I was talking about Japan. So, University of Japan is a uh, U Japan is a consortium member and they obviously want to create their own MOOC platform just like you guys are creating. But they also have a very similar vision they want to create a Japan level stuff and they want to bring in other universities. So, they love this multiversity concept where they can bring in Osaka University and all of the other some hundred universities in Japan to come together. And the you know obviously the business model so there is a you know obviously everybody loves free. So, uh, that is fine, but you know there is a lot of use cases where it has to make sense because as we make it so MOOCs for credit you know sometimes our institutions want to make sure that you know connect with the SIS the tuition is paid the tuition is not paid they want to collect the fees directly for the course level. So, that capability should exist you know paying for certificates uh, you know there are other business models where you can keep MOOC for free, but you can have an innovation innovative ecosystem where you enable anybody in the in the country to say if you want to coach you know like uh, I have heard I mean I had experienced 20 years back in India that private tutoring is a massive business in this country right. And uh, but you know I also see that moms have to drag their kids and take them half an hour to this tuition teacher that tuition teacher it is like too much. Why can't we make that automated? So, that tuition teacher or tutor can come online on their edX platform and teach the students you know some of those business models happening today on Skype as you know there is a very big business where teachers from India make money uh, helping my kids in California do their homework on Skype right. But, but Skype is not a good means I mean it is a tool good tool, but it has its limitations we can do enable that on open edX right and that can actually open up a huge massive opportunity for uh, instructors in India because now they can become a net exporter and sitting at home they can make money. I have a professor at uh, at Stanford uh, who is a good friend and who is the the top math professor of the of the US he is actually by NPR radio the national public radio of the US calls him the math guru um, you know Keith um, uh, Keith Devlin. Uh, and he is actually had a course on uh, on uh, on Coursera not on edX. Uh, you can you, you can uh, Google Keith Devlin fantastic course on math on, on math. He, his course is about math thinking how to think like a mathematician. And he said that um, you know I want to he is very much into this mountain biking and he is like a very sports fellow right. So, he says I want to retire from Stanford in about 2 years you know and I want to go and live in my you know vacation home in Napa valley in the mountains go all day mountain biking and playing golf and all of that stuff. So, Carl can you give me your platform and it is it will be called Keith Devlin you know dot com or whatever where he will put 5 or 6 of his courses and he says that you put all kinds of this different business model and I am mountain biking and my cash register is ringing. So, you know my retirement is getting paid off I do not have to come to Stanford I do not have to come to the classroom I do not have to do nothing everything that I have learned and I want I have known I put it up right. So, these are all the new things will happen which is pretty cool we, well it is you know he has earned his you know at some point he wants to live his own life and he does not want to teach the same thing again and again and again or say solve the same problem or do the same tutoring. So, he says I have done my part now I want to follow my other passion, but I need income create an income from this right. So, so there is a lot of those capabilities. So, that is something that we have built a lot of e-commerce uh, and payment platforms that we had built in my previous company at Visa uh, we brought in um, on the uh, on the open edX. And then the fourth thing that we have learned is that deploying operating maintenance and support you can underestimate that it is not a small thing. So, it is one thing we we see over and over again in the US where you know some organization somewhere in middle of America says oh you know 6 months back we downloaded the edX code we try to do our own we put it up on Amazon and now you know we are not able to do this we are getting this problem that problem. So, it is one thing to have open source and it is another thing to have 2 engineers in a in a department who can download something and play with it completely different thing to operate at scale the level of deployment engineers that you need and having database expertise and DBA expertise and MongoDB and uh, whole kinds of you know MySQL scaling 
very, very different, you know, scale. So, so that's where obviously Anant was very visionary that he realized that this is not that something that he can leave it on to some consulting firms who will just come in and help you consult. You know, consulting doesn't work, you know, because that's like if in the, in the middle of the night if your servers are down, <laughs> that consultant is not going to take your phone call, okay, because he's a consultant. He, you know, he built you by the hours and he's gone. So you need dedicated staff and you need a tremendous amount of expertise. So we are going through currently, we have like over 65 instances of edX running for 65 different institutions, more than 65 now, almost close to 100. So <laughs> I'll show you some of the sites, but we have currently 100 different institutional, you know, multi-tenancy edX running and the level of deployment and every new release that comes out and pushing that, uh, operating it, maintaining it, and then supporting both faculty support and student support enormous. So these are the four key things that we've learned and none of this are simple, none of this can be take li taken lightly, each one of them requires tremendous depth, expertise, and people, and investment. Um, so in terms of, you know, kind of picturizing this, uh, what we have built is on the left side is what we call the cloud service. So we, we named it uh, Knowledge Cloud. And so these are all kind of, as you say, this is, these are all the hundreds of instances. Um, and and we, we run on Open edX. But the way we have designed our architecture is that within our cloud service, we can swap, I mean, you know, an Open edX with a Canvas, with a Blackboard, with a D2L, with a Sakai, with an e-college. Or when we go into a corporate market, you know, they have the cornerstones and the SAPs and the PeopleSoft. So it's a containerized, you know, architecture where the container underlining the, uh, inside the container, it can be anything. And we talk to them through our set of APIs that we have built and then we have built a lot of different applications including a faculty dashboard, collaboration suite and all of that and then there's obviously a lot of multi-tenancy capability built here. And then on the right hand side, we, we, we have realized that you know the mobile phone is the best user uh, you know is the is the is the number one device because in a lot of countries most people don't even have a laptop so it's not even that mobile is the second device or even the first device mobile is the only device so we did mobile first and you know all that social learning and uh, you know capabilities that's all built into what we essentially in a in a high level term we call it peer to peer learning right so instructor is there to give you high quality content, but what is going to motivate you on a day to day basis is the peer to peer because it's your friend. So uh, yeah, I was about to tell you the metaphor. So the metaphor that we had used for this is like fitness, right? So uh, education and fitness is very similar. Everybody wants to keep fit, right? Who wants to add on more weight to your body, right? We all want to look nice and slim and all of that, right? So the motivation is there in, I mean, it's a slightly overlapping thing. The motivation is there, but you know, how many of us, like 95% of the people requires, I mean, sorry, the intent is there to stay fit and do exercise daily, but the motivation to go to the gym every day is not there, right? Because if we are all motivated, we would go to the gym every morning. First thing, six in the morning, we'll hit the gym before even drinking the first cup of tea. That's what they say, that you should go hit the gym before you drink the first cup of tea. How many of us have the discipline or the motivation to do that? But how many of us wants to do that? Everyone. Everyone, right? You'd love yourself more if you can hit the gym at 6 in the morning. So same thing in education. The intent is there. Who doesn't want to be educated? Sure, yeah, it brings you more, you know, quality of life, more knowledge, more fame, more money, whatever, right? But how many of them have the motivation? So then we realize that in the fitness world, the one thing that is keeping people to go to the gym, so, so the, the, the solution to this problem actually lies with not the best PhDs, sorry to say this, or the, or the greatest scientists in the world, the, the solution to this lies with the gym operators. If you ask the owner of a gym, he knows the answer, is the person who, ha who forms, who has a gym buddy, is the one who can keep, to the, keep coming to the gym more often, right? Because if you have a buddy who's gonna bug you at six in the morning and say, get out, I'm waiting downstairs for you. Now you're gonna leave your cup of tea because you can't keep that guy or girl waiting downstairs. Right? So that's where the, you know, we can learn a lot from that, that you know, if we can have that kind of a social learning, mobile, you know, peer to peer learning environment where there's a group based learning, there's team based learning, then there is a level of motivation. 
Um, yeah, and, and then you know, finally, uh, obviously, what we've done is you know we create in 15 minutes. We you can we can we can instantiate you know an addx instance. Um, we we talked about all of this, and then you know more importantly is the ability to do at 180 countries, and then SLAs are very important. So what we are finding is that when we are working with institutions, they want 100% SLA, right? So uh, because without SLA, you really don't know what you're doing. So. Um, I would skip a little bit, but you know, these are some of the maybe you know, if Vijay needs to talk about, but you know, this is some of our, this is our new uh, OpenEdX uh, Docker deployment. You want to say a word about this? Let's yeah, I mean, we are trying to introduce uh, Docker so that we can show uh, things that they want to And uh, that's another exciting way where you actually package your application. So the container is more like a, a ready to run uh, cloud application, for example, yes. and you can really deploy it very fast. So you don't have to worry about the underlying operating system, underlying uh, uh, hardware interfaces, storage, whatever, huh? whatever. It essentially creates multiple it's panels. It's just like a ship dock set in harbor. The ship comes and the docking arrangement is all there. Similarly, you put your application in a docker and it docks. Yep. That is something that we need to investigate. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very powerful uh -huh. architecture. We are trying to get to that. We are not there yet, we're still working. Can I do a, let's see. Is it uh, connecting? Yeah. Okay, can you put this on this as well? Oh. Update settings. Nope. Oh, it's coming up. Oh, coming up. Nope. Or oh, is it too slow, or what is it? It's working. Okay, now it's this is some another thing. It says success. Say success here. I think uh, we have the next thing to go. So maybe uh, I, I'll send out, uh, Professor Fatak has some links, but I'm, I'll send out a, a number of different links where you can see a lot of different variations. Actually, you can just tell them about those uh, cards that you send on the mobile. Yeah, that is yeah. something which yes, I found uh, very interesting. So here. So, uh, sorry, I was trying to do the uh, airplay. Yeah. So actually, you could have seen our mobile app, but uh, we'll, we'll get you out. Yeah, uh, how much you can see. Uh, okay. Oh, you got it? Yeah. So, um, essentially on our mobile app, what we do is this is like the bite size learning. So, any course that you're taking, uh, it brings up in kind of small little cards. And just like, you know, small bite size content. And you can watch this video, which is, you know, uh, eight minutes uh, max. 
and but it's all around okay so we got it oh you have it there okay all good uh, okay and can you all get internet on this yeah okay oh no it's working on the 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 t the t mobile network but it's not uh, i need the wi fi oh, okay It's correct, yeah? okay. All right. Can you do airplay? So I think it's a little bit slow, and it's uh, the resolution is uh, a little bit messed up. But okay. Um, what I wanted to show you was so this is the this is a SDSN is a organization of United Nations. It's Sustainable Development Solutions Network. It's the leading. They are the leading experts from 39 universities on sustainable development, and so this is one of the hundred sites that we are running. And as you can see, uh, it's completely branded with their own URL, but it's, uh, you know, it's run on our platform, which is the, the Knowledge Cloud. And I can go here and um, let me just, uh, you know, log in as a faculty. Oh, this is that keyboard, okay. So I'm going to go into this uh, climate change course. And oh, OK. Is also aircast LMS? No, no, no. no it's, all, there on the it's all. No, it's all edX. Oh, it's all edX. Yeah, yeah that. So uh, the LMS and the CMS is edX. Yeah. And then uh, we have the container technology to to run it, and then we build the APIs for all our apps, which is the social and the mobile and uh, e-commerce and all of that. So um, I don't know. So there's a. I think it's probably uh, the network here. Is there a firewall blocking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have found that uh, problem uh, when we tried to run this uh, open EDX for other outsiders. Mm. Uh, my people would not open certain ports. Huh. So they said this firewall. So what we did is we actually opted an external facing IP address directly from NKN. And a direct wire from NKN goes to his server room. But only in his room, in his server room, those servers can be accessed from outside because those ports are open. They have not opened all, some of the Yeah, in fact, only yesterday, Dr. Agwan, the creator of NKN, was saying that while we have reached so many universities, the universities have not integrated NKN with their own campus networks. Mm -hmm. He said the only people who have done it is IIT Kharagpur, but IIT Bombay has not done it, IIT Madras has not done it. Okay. So maybe what we can do is at some other point in time, yeah. I will be able to demonstrate. Yes, oh, absolutely. Separate. Yeah. But you see. You would be a better demonstrator than me. No. Nah, the beauty of that notion of a card, you know, you heard his bite sized learning. So actually, that mobile app is so fascinating that you, in fact, get just one bite at a time. So that is just one card. And they have interfaces by which, if let's say somebody raises a question, you can either answer it, you can even say like. So you can post your votes directly on that card. And it gets updated onto the EDX platform, it shows everywhere else. So you see, the imagination and interest of the student has to be captured by that app. That is exactly what he means by taking education nearer to entertain. The entertainment captures your interest. That is the primary motive. Primary motive. Okay. And we, we have, um, it's, it's almost the interface almost feels like you are on WhatsApp or Facebook. So essentially, you're going to see a card that one of your friends have sent you. And then you sometimes, you know how on Facebook, we feel very, we feel obligated to like sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Even if you don't like something, you hit the like because just to make the other person feel good. So, they, they, but you know, there is a nice social dynamics in this, right? Even in that new socially awkward situation that Facebook has brought 
for the first time in the human you know psychology. So, what it does is if you use it now positively in education, if I have to make you like something that you do not like, you solve the problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because in education there is a lot of things that we do not like. So, you know slowly your like you know your like will make you connected and then there is all this whatsapp type stuff. So, you know there is a chat going on and then the other thing is that you know it is fully integrated. So, you know you, you write something or you see something you post it on Twitter. Facebook that data that con that content can come back here. So, he has actually acquired a couple of companies which develop these technologies and has integrated all that stuff. Sadly, that part is not open source. So, oh, in fact, well, but, but we have a blessing from edX. So, Ned who runs the Ned Bachelor who is uh, the head of open edX, he actually told us that you do not have to make it open source. In fact, he came up with a policy which says that you know just keep it as an X block because it is much more faster innovation if you just keep it as an X block or an even an LTI to begin with because we can bring it in quickly and you can start seeing the adoption and the deployment because you know in the new startup world you know age, you know agile methodology is the is the number one thing in software development and if we are going to get blocked into all kinds of reviews let us just get it out and then if everything works you can always bring it into the core edX code. So, they do not want too many requests coming in into the core edX code because they have a long roadmap to fix. So, in fact this so because it is an LTI app we have been able to get adoption so fast and we will get into a, you know 100 institutes that we want to do it. So, yeah. So, instantly he has uh, kindly agreed to make all of those available as free usage for our experiment here. Absolutely. No, we do not need source code because of the LTI and X block. We can just use that X block yeah. and. No, but you are you are welcome to uh, work on the source code. We will take all your free bandwidth. I do not have to pay a software engineer in Silicon Valley. Why would I not do that? Please. Good. So, well, thank you. I will conclude here, but if you have any questions, happy to answer. Yeah. Any quick questions because he. I also want him to see some of our facilities and then he has a lunch appointment which also is equally exciting on the environmental activities. He is working on too many fronts. <laughs> too many fronts. But couple of questions or observations very quickly. Uh, by the way, uh, Avinash Aute Hi. is uh, another advisor. We have two advisors from Prakash Vaidya and Avinash Aute. So, Avinash Aute is also an alumnus. Hmm. And, uh, he worked in TCS for donkey's years. He led teams of 1500 people, but he retired to do social service many years ago. I requested him to do social service for my Eklavya project. He is a smartest businessman. He brings everybody as social service and gets your free bandwidth. <laughs> 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 he doesn't pay anybody because no, no. he is using the free labor of the no, university no. students. Uh, now he applies to non-students also. I, 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 <laughs> 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 Uh, so, we have been very fortunate. In fact, he leads uh, the entire software development team effort in whichever way he has because of his experience of TCS. So, of course, he is a hard taskmaster, uh, not very liked. If you put a Google, uh, I mean, if you put a Facebook uh, Open EDX course on giving likes, then I do not know what will happen to Avinash <laughs> <that out. laughs> That would. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, everybody will have to like that. <laughs> okay. So uh, we'll close this, but uh, let me let me conclude this by saying that uh, uh, I think it is one of those fortunate providences that I happened to bang into him. Uh, he and I share the same passion. You heard his initial remarks. Why is into it? Because, and if US has a problem. They have only a cost problem, but we have a reach problem. We have a very large reach problem. And uh, the fact that they are working on open EDX, they have enhanced and enriched it so much. And they are on the same page as us. We want to work together. Let the technology problem be solved by the people who are best capable of solving technology problems. Let the teachers and the pedagogy expert concentrate on how best to provide that knowledge. And that is the model that we are working. I will be discussing in future months with the uh, government 
we had, if you, some of you will know that we have suggested setting up a Section 8 company, uh, which is a not-for-profit company like EDX, but instead of having only university consortium partners, if we could involve private partners, particularly private partners whose passion is in education, so has agreed to consider that, that EDSAT could be a, a, a partner into that company. And um, he is good at finding out revenue models, so he will fix it later, we'll also fix it. But as he says, the primary ambition that he has is the same as ours. First, to do public good, then to earn money. So we are, I think, moving in the right direction. And I'm, I'm so happy and so pleased to work closely with him and now with his team here in coming months. I would like to thank him on behalf of all of you and on my personal behalf for sparing his valuable time. Well, a person who moves with the delegations of Secretary of State and the President of the country uh, to, to spend uh, two, three hours in, in coming here and, and uh, sharing with us. But I think he does that primarily because he carries the same passion that we do. So I do not know how to thank you well enough, but thank you, Carl. Thank you very much. And you. God, God bless you. Uh, we, we have a small memento. It is, it is merely an IIT Bombay X, which is the EDX mug for you to drink coffee. Oh, very good. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, my colleague, Professor Kannan, is here. He is the co-PI, and uh, people call us complex conjugate pole pair. <laughs> with he as the real part and I the imaginary part, because he is mostly here on the ground. But all the projects that we drive, we drive uh, together. Yeah. Apart from being a co-PI, he is also the institute coordinator for all national mission projects. Uh, yeah. So thank you so much thank once again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.